Um, and I'm particularly happy to introduce our first speaker today because, well, her name is Tanya Slavin, and she's a new research associate in our department starting this year, so she'll be around with us for, for a while, at least. And uh, she also works on very interesting languages, something we do not really study very much here at SOAS, namely Algonquian languages spoken in Canada. She's going to talk about it. Uh, she did her PhD in Canada, in Toronto, University of Toronto, uh, working on one of these languages, OG Cree, that's something we're going to hear today, and worked uh, on um, morphology, syntax, semantics, in particular, on the structure of steps. And that's, I understand that the topic of her PhD, and that's also the topic of today's talk. So please welcome Tanya Slavin from, from SOAPIS. <laughs> Ojibwe is, uh, like many Algonquin languages, is a highly endangered language. Uh, it's uh, dying out of many, uh, so most, of, mm, most of its dialects are not uh, spoken anymore by uh, uh, large amounts of people, it's just by a handful of people. Uh, Ojibwe, in this sense, it's a little better off, because possibly because it's geographically it's isolated. You can only get to most of these communities are only accessible by planes, by winter or the winter. So, uh, uh, because of that, the data is quite well preserved. It's uh, around 8,000 speakers. Um, it's also, um, possibly for the same reason, it's uh, the least described data for the language. There is no, there's no uh, uh, grammar for OG3. It's not, it's not very well document, documented at all. But, uh, um, it's also, for me, it's, it's one of the most, it's, uh, the most interesting data because it retains some, some of the productive patterns that are lost in other topics. So, and that's, uh, these are things that I'm interested in, the photosynthesis and, and uh, rich morphological uh, patterns. Uh, and this is what this talk is about. This talk is about the structure of the verb stem in this language. So, um, basically, uh, the goals of all of my work is to, uh, to gather large amounts of data to aid the documentation of language and while analyzing uh, uh, these structures. So as I said, it's a polysynthetic language and the verb stem is uh, usually composed here of more than one person. So in one, uh, one A, you see the template for the verbal complex of this language. So the stem, the, the part that we are going to be concerned with in this talk is in bold but there's various other components of the verbal complex. So it started with a per, um, personal prefix, followed by a tense marker, followed by one or more adverbal modifiers, preverbal modifiers, preverbs they're called, and they're kind of adverbal elements, then the stem, and then uh, the rest of the agreement. Here's an example of the verbal complex that has all of these elements. Uh, that means I secretly drove my friend around, and it starts with the, the personal prefix, ne? Followed by the past tense mark key, then the adverb kimochi secretly, and then you can have as many adverbs as you want here. You can say secretly, yesterday, uh, for some reason. Um, yeah. And then the stem, papa mitapan, and then agreement uh, inflection, indicating that this is first person action, third person. Uh, now, so we're interested in the structure of the stem. The stem itself, papa mitapan, here consists of more than one morphine. In this case, it's, it's a bimorphemic. It, it may contain more than three or more morphemes. So the question is, what is the structure of the stem itself? And what is the relationship between uh, uh, its components? Now, um, how do we know that it's a stem? Because uh, it's the, uh, the 
So a turbine, the element turbine, it means drive by itself, but, but it can stand on its own. It can't start in inflection. In order to say, to say I'm driving here, uh, he's driving, you have to have the papami part. So these two parts work together, papami that. Now, so um, this question has concerned alchemists for a long, long time. What is the structure of the stem? And Chris Wolfert, in one of his uh, papers on Plains Cree, related language, summarized this uh, uh, question very well. Here's what he said. Since the verb term in Algonquin languages usually consists of more than one morpheme, two questions have long been of interest to Algonquinists. How should these morphemes be classified? And what are the relations among the results in classes? Uh, Kroger in 1916 wrote that the undetermined fundamental problem of Algonquin languages is whether these languages say he enter looks or he enters lookingly or enterlingly he looks. While the problem has been under consideration, at least at the time of people saw it, is not much closer to a satisfactory solution today than it was in Kroger's day. So that's the question. How do we analyze the uh, structure of STEM, the relation of convenience components? Now, the traditional view, the traditional uh, the description of the STEM structure in Algonquin languages was written by Bloomfield, and he described the STEM as consisting of three elements, basically uh, according to a predefined template. These elements are, are called according to their position relative to each other. So they're called uh, initial, the element at the beginning of the stem, Medial is whatever is in the middle, and final is whatever is in the end. So um, here are some examples of the stem and how they, of stems and how they would fit into this template. So takisite, she has cold feet, has all three elements. So at the beginning is some kind of vegetable element taki, then medial is usually some kind of incorporated nominal, and final uh, is a, a category defining element. So it depends, it's here it says that it's a, a transitive verb, it takes an element such. Uh, now the next one, Bakpi uh, laughed at someone has uh, two of these elements, so uh, the root laughed, and the uh, category defined and final. So Pa is the initial of this template in this diplomatic approach, and E uh, is the final. Uh, another example is Ompiki. She grew up Ompi and Ki, initial, final. And then you can also have stem that consists of only one, one element, Nini, for instance, and uh, dancing. So this is a, 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 a view that's accepted pretty much universally by all subsequent scholarship. So the, the stem, stems in a lot of languages consist of, are built on a template, initial medium file. Now that's a, it's a useful descriptive device, but it's not very, it doesn't tell us a lot about the structure of the stem, what's going on inside, and what the, the relationship between its components. So uh, in my work, uh, and it's been also a, uh, done by many, by by other people, uh, implicitly or explicitly, they try to move away from the template and uh, figure out what's going on. So in this talk, I'm going to look at two different types of stems, so two unrelated constructions. In the first part, I'm, part, I'm going to look at bipartite stems, and the second part, I'm going to look at stems that involve non-incorporation, possess non-incorporation. So it's uh, two different constructions. Uh, basically, they sh uh, I'm gonna, they're going to have different analysis, but they, they both show you that uh, this, there's no way you can fit a stem into a predefined template. You, can, you have to analyze uh, them in different ways. So, uh, it'll be pretty dense in terms of data and uh, analysis, but uh, hopefully we'll keep it uh, simple. So, bipartite stems. Uh, in these stems, uh, call them bipartite because uh, the root in these stems has to be preceded by something else some additional verbal materials. For instance, impacto, pacto uh, uh, means run by itself, and you can argue whether it's a consist of pacto or just pacto and to, to, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no agreement with that. But pacto means run by itself, uh, but you can't just say he's running pacto. You have to add image, right, he's running along. Uh, the same is the case of 3D. Peachy women carry something over, we means a carry, but you have to say have peachy carry over here. And minoshimo, you can just say shimo dance, you have to say minoshimo. So the question is, why is this a verbal there? Why do we have to have it there uh, to have a full the stem? Um, so we can say that bipartite stems are subject to a left edge requirement. It's a term that's been used uh, in the Algonquin to translate a different way. But I'm using it here to uh, uh, describe this pattern. So this is the question that, that's going to concern us uh, in this part of the talk. 
what is the adverb element doing here? Now, uh, I need to remind you of the position of the stem in the verbal complex. So remember that the stem is preceded, optionally preceded by, by a, a verbal or preverbal modifier, or I'm going to sometimes call it preverb, or stem external modifier. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that the stems of the Nismota, the three, the five are stems, are similar to the construction to the five that involve the preverbal modifier plus a whole stem. Uh, it, where here the preverbal modifier is the same element as the left change element in five are stems. Okay? So when I say left change element, I mean this internal adverbal that has to be inside the stem. So if you compare the, the, these are minimal pairs, well, almost, uh, well, not minimal, uh, but pimi pacto, in the case of pimi pacto 3D, pimi is a uh, verbal uh, along, it's inside the stem, but pimi nikamo in 5A, it's outside the stem, if you put the world say nikamo, he's thinking. Okay. Pimi is optional here. Uh, five, in 3B, peachy is inside the stem, peachy went carry over here, we can also have peachy as an optional verbal, peachy papamose, 5B, if you're working in the direction, you can just say papamose, it's fine. Um, yeah, the same in all of this. Now, this is what I call the left, so left edge requirement, so in extension 3, the verbal has to be there. Now, another way to look at this, uh, about this question is, what is the difference between the constructions of 3 and then 5? Why is it that 3 is obligatory, when 5, you don't have to have it there? Now, there's been various proposals uh, um, about this requirement, uh, saying that it's an arbitrary morphological property in uh, uh, a prosodic requirement or a syntactic requirement. So I, I don't have time, unfortunately, to go over this uh, proposal here, but I will explore the uh, possibility that the left edge requirement is actually a semantic requirement. It has to do with the vector position. So basically, the element in the left edge fills the gap in the semantic of the root and uh, completes the event position. I forgot to say that I call these roots weak roots uh, to distinguish them from a different type of root that I'm not talking about here. So, yeah. But uh, sometimes I remember them as weak roots. Uh, this roots form by my dance stems. Okay, so I'm going to first uh, uh, do a general overview of what can appear on the left edge, basically to give you an idea of what can appear here. And then I'm going to uh, present a proposal and test this proposal uh, with various predictions. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here's one example of a weak root that can be preceded by various uh, language uh, elements. So mo means speak x, speak some language, but you can't use mo by itself. You have to, you have to have something there. So nishna mo she speaks Ojibwe, or you can say Ojibwe mo she speaks Ojibwe. You can say aganashi mo she speaks French. Vimutikoshi mo she speaks English. Or Vimutikoshi is a, a noun means a, a white person. Uh, so these are all, all nouns that appear on the left edge. My uh, Simo, she speaks one of the languages of overseas. Uh, we here. Overseas is here now. Pinishishimo, she speaks a bird language. There's a bird language. So it, it's a very, very productive pattern. Uh, it, it's it's uh, not an exhaustive list. These are examples of any way that you can deal with this uh, uh, root. It's a very, very productive pattern. So we can say that more means something like speak the language of gap in the left edge element fills the gap by supplying uh, the name of the people or another root doing the Now another root with similar meaning is use language in a certain way. Um, um, so here we can have a, a slightly wider range of elements. You can say Wapusin Kishi Kishiwe, she speaks the red language. Um, where Ishi is a kind of linker that, that uh, that connects the verb uh, Kishiba to a uh, nominal outside, like a speaks like a You can say Nishinade Mo Kishiba, she speaks logically. Now, here, notice that um, in 6a you had Anishinade Mo, and that Anishinade is a noun, means a logically person, a man. But Anishinade Mo Wi is a logically language, so you have to have a noun for language here as opposed to a noun for a person. Um, Oops. 
Right, so what was I? Uh, yeah, and this one is also very reproductive. So you can say, uh, Agami Hishigami Hishigami where she speaks uh, a language from across the sea. Um, as in 7C, 7E, and uh, all kinds of other uh, nouns for languages. But not only for languages, you can say, uh, as in 7G in the next page, you can say, Machi Hishigami, that would mean that uh, there'll be something idiomatic in speech. She used bad language squares. Or Mino Kishave, she doesn't swear. So Kishave means uh, use language in a certain way. And then uh, uh, the left edge element here uh, fills the gap by providing uh, uh, either supplying a name of language or a quantifier or a verbal of manner or something like that. Um, I'm going to skip eight. And I'm going to example nine, Kaso. Kaso is another example of a, of a weak book, pretend. So Anaki Kaso, in, in this, this one um, takes any kind of verb and, or any kind of noun. So I can say, uh, she pretends to work, Anaki Kaso. She pretends to uh, uh, sleep, Nipa Kaso. I'm skipping over. But you can look at the examples later. Too. Uh, you can have a complex verb, like when I wish in Nipa Kaso is an IT. When I wish in Nipa, she has no place to sleep. You can have a step with its own adverbal modifiers. Uh, one very interesting example that I'm hoping to figure out at some point is, is 9F. When a winning when a winning mark so she pretends that she misses him, so this one has reflection inside. Uh, so uh, and I've checked with several speakers. So it's pretty reliable, but I haven't seen with any other kind of words or you haven't touched inside. But that's like um, let's go to uh, page seven. Amato is a weekly scene. You can see slowly, Topeta Amato, you can say fast, Kiji Amato, you can say well, they sing well, Mino Amato, or sing Walking Pimi Amato, or you can say together, sing together, Mama, 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 you are Mama, so what? You can say, you can sing as an 11G, Wani Hamazo, she's singing the long song, or Wani means long. Uh, you can say, you can sing, uh, you can say, Oshkini Kiwi Nikomo Yamazo, that's 11I, and Oshkini Kiwi Nikomo, my young person song, but, but it's, uh, uh, it actually is a pop song, or rap. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you can uh, even have a verb stem here for uh, resolutive for defective meaning, as in the last example for 11, 11 J. Kinipea mouth with quizzes. That means that could mean the girl sang until she fell asleep, or that means that could mean the girl sang in her sleep. Um, so here in this case, left edge element can be manner, or direction, a verb or a validative, or a kind of linker, that I'm going to talk about the linker stuff here. Uh, or a nominal referring to a kind of song or a verb step. Okay. Um, right. Let's look at the last one, Tafan, 13. Tafan drive someone. So you can drive along. You can Tafan and Totem along with someone. You can drive around, the example that we saw at the very beginning, the new papa metapana, drive around, come somebody around. You can drive here, you can drive in the wrong direction, you can drive from a certain place, you can drive loudly as in 13F, or Matue Tapana no Washishan, Ash is her driving. You can drive slowly, you can be busy driving, it's in H, so you can have all kinds of things here. So directional, mannered verbals, um, and uh, <coughs> going to quantify it in mention of the sentence. It's uh, 13i. I learned that I drove all the kids to school. Check your first the internal argument. Now, uh, here are two central, uh, one central observation here that we, that we can uh, uh, make here is that the left edge element can supply direction, manner, result, or accompaniment of these things. 
Now, these are usually elements that are uh, subject to components of band composition. So I'm going to uh, propose that the stem uh, in OG3, in particular the bipartite stem, corresponds to an event. And all the elements in the stem contribute to event composition. So syntactically, we can represent it as event phrase, EP, and the structure is on the next page. Now, the structure looks complicated, but it's going to all the details here. Uh, all that you need to note is, is that um, um, the left edge element, so the EP is the uh, uh, stem. The left edge element here, PIMI, and it originates as a, as a complement of the root. We is a weak root here, originates as a complement of the root, and then uh, moves to the left edge as a, as a uh, to specify our EP. It looks kind of stipulative here all the movement, so, but it, I have the evidence elsewhere that it moves. I don't have the explanation why it moves, but I have evidence that it moves. But it's all, it's, it's irrelevant for this, uh, the purpose of this talk. Also, all you need to remember is that the uh, PME is inside the EP, it's, it's a left edge element. Okay? EP is the stem. Now, uh, I also do that event composition is manifested syntactically and, and can be visible through the scope of adverbials in particular. So some adverbials, higher level adverbials, need to take scope over the event, but lower level adverbials participate in the event composition. So yeah, these two kinds of adverbials, the distinction is very crucial. Now, if, if the, the proposal is the stem is an event, then we predict that only those elements, only those adverbials that participate in the event composition can, will be able to appear in the left edge. The elements that uh, high level elements shouldn't be able to uh, appear in the left edge. But they have to take scope over the entire event. Okay, so this is the prediction. And I'm going to test these predictions uh, with the, uh, using the three of the variables. So, so far I've looked at what can appear on the left edge just over you, and now I'm going to look at what can't appear there. So, the previous, those adverbials modifiers that I mentioned at the beginning that precede the stem, uh, they can lower into the stem. We've only already seen an example of that. So, so PME, PME Bacto, PME along outside the, uh, inside the stem means run, but the same, the same ad adverbial can appear outside. So that's the question that I asked at the beginning. Why is sometimes inside and outside? So here's a, a, the structural representation of that. You can say Minunakose, uh, she looks nice, being not inside the stem, so inside, inside the, uh, no sorry, the mino here is, uh, is outside the stem because now it's inside the stem. So in 15, you see that there's two le two PB levels. So mino is not here, here. now now is a verb in the stem. Okay, EP, it's just, it's just out, it's outside the first EP, so outside the stem. Now, but if you have the same minuma, it smells nice, then you have to have mino inside. So makusi is not a verb, it's, it's a root meaning stem, uh, smell. So you have to have, you have to smell nice, you can just smell. Of course in English, so different things too. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the minimal character in, in 16. Mino appears inside the first EP, you can see the structure. So it's, it's on the left edge, it's a big here. Now, in this case, there's no obvious difference between the meaning of the, of the three verb outside and inside the stem. But the proposal predicts that with other uh, three verb modifiers, there will be a difference, or some, some of them won't be able to lower. I'm going to test this with several uh, kinds of uh, uh, adverbials. So, higher level adverbials like speaker or even the sentence level elements. Then relative preverbs, linkers, I'm going to tell you what they are, and a spectral element. Uh, okay. So, one example of a higher level element is mochi. Mochi means just the speaker oriented element. Um, you can say mochi as matepe yimachi, just sit in the sun over there. Um, so, here, mochi is outside the stand. Uh, so we predict that mochi shouldn't be able to appear in the left edge of the stem. But here you have a minimal pair in 18, uh, 18A and B. So you can say, 
I want to talk to you about the just dance all the time. Mochi image, mochi is outside the stem. It's fine to say that. Mochi just dance. But you cannot say the same thing using the verb mochi shimo. Shimo is a root meaning dance. It needs something on the left edge to become a stem. You can't use mochi to complete the stem composition here. Okay, so the the H and B is ungrammatical. So mochi can't appear on the left edge of the stem. Uh, I'm going to skip the rest of this and move to 2.3.2. This is a little bit more interesting. Uh, so, the elements that I call linkers are also called relative rules, relative reverbs, now I'll come later. So, these elements that uh, link the verb to some accompanying circumstance uh, that's indicated outside the verbs, uh, verb of context. So, in a certain place, and then the place is indicated somewhere, or in a certain manner. So onchi, in particular, means uh, from a certain place or for, for a certain reason. But it can have several different meanings. So it can be directional, and this uh, is meaning as a preverb outside the stem. You can, you can say, shavanam kochitake, and a cold wind is blowing from the south, onchi, outside the stem. Uh, it can be in quotative, ketaftame on it is 22b, ketaftame onchitake sete, if you've got cold something there. It can be, it can also form negative past as a 23 uh, AD. So, how much do you become a drop? So, that means there we didn't leave any tracks. How much do you get a form negative past? Now, my proposal predicts that only the directional meaning of quantity should be able to appear outside the stand because that's uh, the only one that contributes to event composition. And this is indeed the case. So directional onchi grammatical grammatical outside the stem. You can say shamanan onchi no we. Onchi is inside the stem, here on the left edge, wind is blowing from the south today, and it's a minimal pair of one. Shamanan onchi taki no we onchi was outside the stem, but shamanan onchi no we is inside the stem. It's fine inside. But in poetic onchi is grammatical stem internal, so you can't say kena tharin onchi no we is not in the wind. It's not growing. That's a uh, um, uh, you cannot, you, you also, so my consultant actually fixed, try to fix it uh, by uh, a certain uh, lo uh, location. There. So, can I have an e way to want to know she wanted the wind to grow from, from there. She wanted to be to make it directional, so it can be quoted here. Now, on to negative past, also ungrammatical inside this time. So, you can't say, how much how much wapus, there we didn't, uh, didn't give any tracks, that's ungrammatical. You have to say, how much pimic Another uh, linker is the uh, Ijen, means to, to a certain directional place. And it can also have several meanings inside the stem, uh, outside the stem, as a preverb. So it can be directional. Way to Ijen Pimekawebapus, the rabbit tracks are going in that direction, so Pimekawe is a stem that Ijen attaches to. Uh, it can link the event to a temporal antecedent, as in uh, 29A and B. So you can say, Megwache kisiste pasio anitaijin nikam. I often sing in the shower, so so nikamu uh, is a stem meaning sing. Isha links the stem to the external circumstance uh, while in the shower. We can also form an event nominal, uh, as in thirty. So nivija kaiji kishpukshwasunano. So together with with the uh, suffix k uh, here in the commonplace kan. EG forms uh, event on our craft session. So again, we predict that only the directional EG should be able to appear inside, but not the other two meanings. And this is indeed the case. So you can say 31, wait EG Kawe Wapus, brevet strikes are going in that direction, and that's fine, just like uh, 28, wait EG Pimit Kawe. So EG inside, directional EG inside is fine. Um, but event related EG is ungrammatical inside this tent. You cannot say Megwati. Hamas, where Hamas is a room being seen. We are trying here to put Ije inside the stem on the left edge. That's ungrammatical. We can't say it should be Hamas. Okay. Um, so if you, can, you cannot say Migwash Kapikun Kishikabil Kapus, trying to uh, during the winter rabbit leaf tracks. So uh, the intended meaning is, is temporal here during the winter and temporal antecedent. But the only possible meaning is this directional. During the winter, the rabbit tracks go over there, or something, <coughs> something like that. Okay. And the event nominal is also ungrammatical. So you can't say any kaj kashwat kajikwasunanwa. 
so you can have the rate of stamping. So as predicted by the proposal that the stamping event, the only the directional meanings of linkers can appear inside the stamp, but the spectral or negative past and event-related meanings cannot appear inside. Now let's look at the directional and spectral uh, restrictions on spectral elements. So spectral elements refer to, um, in general, refer to the internal structure of the event that is denoted by the group. Um, now, uh, Eric suggests that uh, a spectral modification cannot appear in event internally, but has to combine with the full event. There is also another view that um, uh, it's present any that uh, spectral adverbs can appear above the event level and inside the event level. So there's two different kinds of spectral uh, adverbs. So a spectral adverbs above the core event level can take uh, so it can take a scope over the core event. But spectral uh, elements within the core event must participate in the event. So we'll see the difference between these two here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look at three uh, spectral elements. Keyword, uh, again, or back, Machi start, and Puni stop. So here's an example of Kiwe back. So for instance, we have this uh, scenario. A mother is waiting for a child to finish playing and come home with her. Uh, as the child is about to run towards her, the child yells, I'm running back already. So in this case, you can say kiwi outside the stem, kiwi pim pakto, that's fine. You can also say ajani kiwi pakto, kiwi inside the stem. So for directional meaning, both positions of kiwi are okay. But here's another scenario. If for instance I had a sore ankle, which prevented me from following my running routine, and when I finally got healed and I go for my first run, I yell, I'm, I want to really yell, I'm running again. In this case, I can say ajani kiwi pim pakto, kiwi outside the stem. Uh, again, that's the spectral again, right? Uh, but I can say Ajini Kiwe Pakto, meaning uh, I'm running again, they can only be directional. Okay? And another example is, is a very forced so I can say Kiwe Machi Kishiko, the tree is growing again, the Kiwe outside, but I can say Kiwe Kishiko, uh, Kiwe Kishiko. So it sounds like, like someone said, it sounds like the tree is going backwards. Okay? So, or ongoing. So when kiwi is inside the stem, the left edge can only have direction, meaning you cannot have the spectral meaning again. Okay. Another example is with the uh, machi, means start or away. Now we're going to see that machi behaves differently with motion verbs and non-motion verbs. So with motion verbs, um, Like for instance, drive. Only the directional region of much is available stem and turn. So let's example. So the I'm going to start driving next month. Much is outside the stem. Uh, but 37B, next month. Uh, I'm going, it can be only mean I'm drawing, going on a road trip. So in the second example, much is inside the, inside the stem. Much is on the left edge. It can only be direction I'm going over there, driving away. It cannot mean I'm going to start driving. Okay. Uh, if it's a non motion verb, then there are two different strategies. So some, some speakers, it depends on, on, the, on the speaker, which strategy, strategy is employed. So for some speakers, Machi inside the step adds a directional component instead of being a spectrum. So so the verb angry, be angry is not, not, not a motion verb. So you can say, Aja machi kishawasi, machi outside the stem. It's just, it means start to get angry. You start to get angry. But if you try to put machi inside the stem with the root meaning angry, Aja machi amazing. It means something like she's storming off angry. She has, so it says movement component to choose. Um, angry away, meaning, yeah, uh, right away angry. Now the second strategy that speakers employ is quite interesting. It's, uh, so Machi can have an spectral reading inside the stem for the speakers, but uh, can only have certain uh, restricted flavors. So for instance, uh, if you describe an episodic event, 
then Machi can appear either outside or inside the stem. So you can, you can, if you want to say, my baby just started crying right now over there in that room, you can say, Ajni Bebe Machi Mate Mata Temo. Mate started crying, Mat, in this case, inside the stem. Or you can say, Mate Machi Mawe, started crying outside the stem. Either way is fine. Start crying. If you're talking about an habitual event of crying, then uh, you can only have machi outside the stem. You cannot have it in the left edge position. So here's an example. When my son was a baby, he hardly ever cried, but when he turned two, he started crying a lot. So we're talking about the habitual uh, crying. So in this case, you can say, uh, he started crying a lot, machi as the stem external of the You cannot say, that means he started crying right now. So the stem external machi takes place in the event. They see the stem within the event, and the stem external machi takes hope over it. That's why both readings are possible. You can have stop inside the stem or outside the stem. But if, for instance, you stop me, eat me completely, and that's in uh, 46, and then we're talking about uh, uh, habitual non eating meat, right? You became a vegetarian. In this case, 46, and you can say, Niki Puni Mich and Vyas, I stop eating meat with Puni outside, but you, can, you cannot say Niki Puni and Vyas. With Puni outside the stem. Okay. So just like with the Machi start, if you're talking about it, uh, one time it's fine to have the, the inside the stem, you can contribute to the event composition. But if it's an habitual event, you have to have an event for it first before you can. Spectral elements cannot appear in the okay. So let's uh, go to page 23. Basically, uh, so this is all uh, all the restrictions that I want to talk about. In the so we've seen that uh, higher level elements like speaker oriented elements cannot appear inside this hand. Uh, spectral elements have only the uh, restriction to the range of flavors inside the stem, and linkers also can have meanings like directional or manner, but they cannot be event-oriented or spectral. Okay. So hopefully this convinces you that uh, the, the stem, this language, the, 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 my proposal of the stem, this language is an event, and all, this, all the elements of the stem contribute to event composition. Okay. So, to answer the question, what was the left edge element do it in, in, in Viper the the it was contributing to the composition of the uh, event. Okay. Now this also shows you that, uh, that the structure of the stem cannot be explained cannot be explained using a traditional template. So if you just fit this elements into the template, the initial media fine doesn't tell you anything. So we have to go much 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 further than that. To understand it. Uh, and uh, Actually, the way I use the term root here is, is very, very, very different from, from the ways we saw about in the Balkan literature. So it's, it's uh, uh, very far apart from that. Uh, so I want to look at one more construction uh, that involves the incorporation of process now. That's a completely complete different type of terms, but that's a, a, a more recent thing that I've been working on more recently, but it's in the same. Part of the same larger project to understand the, the, the analyzed stem structure. Um, okay, so the uh, Daki is, is a stem that we looked at the very beginning. A stem that has all three elements of the template Daki, initial, sit, medial, and a final. Daki Sitesis has all three, so uh, it has all three elements of the template. Now, again, we want to analyze the stem beyond the traditional template. Uh, and again, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask the same question here. So, if we have, if the suffix, if, if the final a uh, means uh, not possession have, you have the, uh, and you have the your noun, why can't you just say sit there? She has feet, as in fifty. It's ungrammatical. We have to. She has to have cold feet in order for this verb to be grammatical. So, uh, it's also the question of the. Uh, left edge requirement of what is the left edge I'm going to do it here, but I'm going to answer it in a bit different way. So why is it in this case we have to have, have to say that uh, she has cold feet? Why can't I just say she has feet? 
there's another way to say she has she doesn't have to have cold feet all the time. Yeah, so basically what is the morphosyntactic makeup of this uh, stem and what is the relation between stem components? I'm going to propose eventually uh, that uh, the cytox E doesn't build in all position. What it does is that it selects for a small clause complement and relate the proposition in this small clause to the enemy argument that it's specified. And the age of element is actually the predicate of the small clause. So first I'm going to look at the, some properties of possessive stem because it's, al it's also a very under-described under construction in logic theory, so it is the most constructions in logic theory. Uh, so, and it's very, very, very productive. So you can have uh, different types of nouns uh, and modifiers. So you can, you can have, here's some examples in 3.1.1. Mishinoabite uh, nikos is Losan has many many teeth. Mishinoabite many teeth have. Uh, you can have it with all kinds of uh, inelegant possessed nouns like teeth, pants, blankets. So uh, body parts and clothes are in inelegant possessed in, in this language. Um, and relatives like daughter and partner. So you can have uh, you can have old feet. You can have a new partner with his work. You can have it with uh, any kind of nouns, and also any of possessed, as in uh, 52. So you can have, uh, you can say, I have a big axe. 52, 52, 52, 52. You can say 52 C. I have a hole in my pillowcase. Or your have a hole in my pillowcase. Or your modifier is hole, have a hole in my pillowcase. Um, you can say Doshki again does have a new telephone number. New telephone number. Uh, okay. Now let's go to page twenty seven. So the noun can also be incorporated with the uh, uh, one or more modifiers. For instance, fifty six. My new pillow is too hot, so you can you can say Incorporate the complex noun new pillow. And you can sign the page at the question one. So, Oshke at the question one is the complex noun and new pillow. New pillow is hot. Um, yeah, we can say I have two big hats. Incorporating the noun big hat. Nijo maki tiguane. So, the noun here can also be referential. Um, There's a 57. You can say the monster has two hats with the with the noun head and portrait, and then you can refer back to it saying one is big and one is small. Okay. Uh, and you can also you can also <coughs> have modifiers for this noun outside of the outside of the verb stem. So you can say uh the one in push the monster is the two heads. And then basic bakasity one the common basic one work in this case the numeral of basic is outside, uh, outside the person in the center, so it's not attached to the noun, to the noun. It's a strength modifier. Okay? So these all properties that are common, there is noun incorporation constructions in other language and, and have been um, noticed for other noun incorporation constructions in Ojibwe, in Ojibwe in particular, but um, they weren't described with this particular construction. But the most interesting question is, what is the structure of the, of the possessive stem, of, of these stems? Now, uh, to read the, uh, the set of data that I had before is, why can you say that is a there, but not see there? 59A is OK, but, 50, uh, but 60 is not. You, you have to have the top feet apart, the whole feet. <coughs> now, to answer this question, we're going to look at some uh, data, some uh, um, examples that have to do with the uh, uh, focus. So let's look at 61. For instance, uh, so this verb is looks like it's, it's a well formed verb, it should be grammatical. So you have a modifier, noun, incorporate noun, and then uh, the uh, category finds something there. She was a pop camp. She was a uh, uh, sweet lady, but uh, pop camp. Do you say pop or soda or? Carbonate water. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
when, when you assume that that Oshki is a predicate, then in the, it derives the focus effect that we discussed earlier because the subjects are all presupposed presuppose information and predicates are new, inform is new information. Car is new as opposed to, yeah, uh, just being a modifier, a new car. It's a, it's a, it's a predicate here. Car new. Yeah, and then at some point it has to it has to <coughs> the, the left page. Okay. So these stems, the possessive uh, stem with possessive noun preparation, uh, also look more more uh, they're more complex than they look, and they they're very very dynamic structures. We've seen that they're very very productive, and they actually involve uh, I argue that they involve a small of preparation rather than traditional noun preparation in the traditional sense. So the uh, large uh, the conclusion for all this is that uh, uh, I've kind of combined the project that I've been working on lately. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I want to give you an overview of how, how complex this stuff is and, and how interesting. And that uh, you can't use a template to describe any positive language in or degree in particular. And you need to uh, analyze each type of stem in particular and we still uh, separately, and we still wonder what a word is in this language. That's all very, very interesting and uh, complicated. <laughs> because I was uh, really interested in what you were saying about the um, linguistic encoding of events. And, I mean, you just said in your conclusion that you really have to look at you know, every construction in its own light, but I, I would still like to ask you um, about possible um, generalizations you, you may want to make about classes of stems, maybe. I mean, some of them, just glimpsing at them, look as if they're always transitive, so they're always an object, which might also be a possessor. I mean, there's this huge debate anyways, you know, between parallels, between natural arguments, possessive and peace. Or some look as if they always need to have a manner component and then event structure. So, did you attempt any generalizations in terms of event structures, predicate decomposition, or uh, looking, comparing structures? and organized terms when they have the macro event properties and when they you mean the operators have always go over the entire events, segmenting them into sub-events and trying to um, formalize the distinctions between the operators, so things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like a more formal semantic analysis. Yeah. I'd like to do that at some point, but I feel that you need to log oh, you not, not necessarily yeah. formal, I mean, but yeah. just a semantic generalization yeah. that maybe can yeah, there's definitely classes, uh, types of, like, if you're talking about binary types, mm -hmm. only, there are subtypes of them. So uh, there's uh, like a type that takes everything, mm -hmm. and that it's very hard to distinguish what is, it, what is the difference between a uh, rule that means sing, that mm -hmm. has to have something, and then a stem that, uh, uh, that full stem that means sing. Yeah, so in this case, it's, this case is a kind of challenge, uh, challenge for me because um, it looks like it's arbitrary. Sometimes you have to say saying, you know, it's just an arbitrary component for me. But in some cases, it's, it's you can only have uh, uh, only manner modifiers. Yeah, or only. So, yeah. So, like the I said that we could have a gap, but the, the type of gap is different mm -hmm. in, in, in for every class. Yeah, not every group, but groups of. Yeah, uh, still a lot of work to do. What is it that they need to see how to reach out that? Questions, comments? Oh, they're quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I do have a very small question. In example 13K, I'm just not too sure what one of the elements in the gloss means, so I just wanted to check with you. In the 13K that you said that 
Subject and third person object will be different. Yeah, the, the, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think that's how you would say. When you want to pass, you would just have three, uh, not three, not always not one of three. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's all. That's all. I think. Yeah. Just yeah. Thank you so much. But just yeah, also can have over things like uh, I don't know what you call them, like verb uh, type endings that go in the final so you've got uh, animate and transitive. Mm -hmm. But they're not they're different with different verbs. Like is that some sort of paradigm what the type so you got here yeah. you've got in two A F encodes animate and transitive. But then you have a zero morphing for that in three A. Yeah, it could be so, really different different kinds of it's a closed class, but there's uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. There are several that indicate that the verbs is a uh, transitive, as long as we're asking data questions, like along the same lines, I wasn't always clear what marked the aspect or the tense. So the, the tense is marked by the, um, uh, a prefix outside the tense, so key like in one A. In the past ones, yeah, but so for instance in like the examples in three, you mean aspect? I mean whatever it is. There's no there's no there's no tense marker here or aspect. So no like three A versus three C, how do you know it's not she is dancing well or three oh, uh, A she could be she runs along versus she is running? Right. So either way, I don't know why I wrote it here differently, but uh, it could be she dances or she dances. But so what indicates? Oh well, nothing. We you we don't know, you can use it either way. You can say she's dancing or she dances. So that's like a sort of default form or something, and then the past would be marked with that key. Mm, yeah. Okay. And then also along the same lines, what what indicates it's the the third person in the singular? Um, the last personal mark. So again, it's like a default. Sort yeah. Of. Okay. So this is like the bare stem we could get. All right. That's Well, you are thinking that me ask a good question. Maybe, maybe I missed it. Your analysis of possession, possessive constructions, uh, say here that uh, the proposition denoted by the small clause, the element argument of the by the specifier. How important this animacy restriction is? Why does it have to be? And what happens to the amendment? Um, 
and both have to follow from the session. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. You, you can't use you can have the table has uh, four uh, complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you can't. 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 Hey, no, yeah. it's, I mean, it's a grammatical distinction between the language. So the verbs, the verb, I mean, the nouns are either anyways and then Yeah. But basically, for your analysis, it's just the statement of the fact that it's not true. Yeah. For yeah, the structure. Yeah. and then in five or ten minutes I can meet you just yeah. outside the front steps. Is that right? No obligation. 